I'm here today with Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hi. And we are, uh, are going to talk about, I think, circles and lines and time. But before we get to that, I wanted to get to know Kevin a little bit better. So I wondered if you could tell me some of your background, Kevin. All right. Uh, I'm a pastor's kid. Uh, grew up in the Pentecostal church. Um, uh, I had some ins and outs uh, with, with faith uh, around uh, mid high school. And eventually I just got to the point where I said, you know, I can't not believe. So it, it, it got, it got to that point. Um, where Wait, there a particular thing that happened that, that, um, no, that's the weirdest part about it is that it wasn't a particular aha moment. It was, uh, a, a whole lot of little things. It was a, a, a gentle and, steady piling on of of I don't know personal personal evidence it it's like I wish I could point to one moment I can't <laughs> well so so let me explore this a little bit so when you were when you were wandering away and you mm. were having a lot of doubts how did your parents approach that they didn't know they didn't know <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it, it, it was that subtle. It was just like I, I was just kind of like uh, I I don't know how I feel about this. And then, uh, getting through high school, I was just kind of like, you know, I'm fine with that. I'm 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 good with this. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get stronger in it. Um, and it it, it so, uh, Vander Clay. You know, being a Calvinist, he said he would say, "I never left." <laughs> it's just like, well, okay, sure, but the 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 it was it was the struggle going on at the time, um, and I had been bombarded with the usual arguments of of the from the scientific crowd, and but I had a really good science teacher that instead of bombarding me, she said. Okay, as far as the religion question goes, uh, we can't prove or disprove anything. Moving on. And that's where she left it. <laughs> I was just like, oh, okay. It's, I don't have to deal with this in school anymore. It's like, that's, that was nice. Um, at least for that school. But I ended up moving schools and then it became a gentle debate between me and my friends for the next four years. So I guess well, that kind of strengthened me. What did you major in? Um, oh, you mean, uh, uh, college? Oh, you're still talking about high school. High school. Yeah. Oh, high school, okay. Yeah. okay. I only did two years of college. I never, I never okay. got the degree or anything. Okay. Yeah. So you're still talking high school. All this change was, wow. So you yeah. have been a little bit precocious to, um, to go through that process in high school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was. It was rocky, um, and the the expanded background is that we moved a lot, and so that messed with my foundations. Like I didn't have a core group of friends that I always had. You know, I always I was always switching around and trying to meet new people, and eventually, and at that at that point in time. I had got to the point where I said, well, why bother making friends? I'm not going to know them for more than two or three years. And that was really awkward because high school was the time at which we had lived somewhere the longest. We were there for like seven years and I should have put more investment into that than I didn't know we were going to be there that long. Well, and that's also when typically you're trying to find your own identity and figure out who you are, hmm. what, um, what drives you? <clears throat> so did, did you come to a conclusion about who you are? What drives you? What, um, um, I had, I had worked on that previously 
and kind of dropped it. I had said a while back, like, I want to be a writer, and that that didn't culminate until um, that didn't culminate until I graduated from high school. Uh, because through high school, like the the first semester of high school, I was in a completely different school uh, because we had just found a house, and so. I'm in a different school, we find a house, I move to a different school. So the second semester, all of my credits are gone, I have to redo all of my classes, you know, not, nothing transferred. So I'm upset and angry and tired and uh, the first hour of the first day, I go into earth science and I sit down and I look over and there's this like six foot something kid who, it, is really weird and like I I thought it was the weirdest person I had ever met and I still think that to this day and he became my best friend <laughs> and he he and I had been working had had been had been trading these ideas back and forth and that those eventually turned into stories and eventually I had taken all of those stories and then smashed them all into one big story and those percolated in my brain for four years. And finally, I call him up after we're already graduated and I'm just pacing back and forth in my room and I'm angry at myself. And I said, Colin, I can't get these stories, I can't get this story out of my head. And he said, well, just write it down. It's like, like it was easy. <laughs> like yeah thanks a lot well i i ended up writing i i i was like okay i'm gonna do this so i took out like the you know the big the big yellow legal paper and just started writing it down and i wrote one page one huge page of this war that isn't even in the story anymore <laughs> and it it grew from there and the more the more I wrote, the easier it got. But the the initial problem of writing, and writers will tell you this all the time, is getting the idea started. And once you get that, like you finally have a foundation. It's like it's the foundation thing again. If you have no foundation, there's nothing to to work. It's like if a a book is not, a book is not, a, a, this'll, this'll go into the time thing. A book is not an A to B thing. A, a book is like clay. You have to mold it and take parts off and put some other parts back on and, and change things around. And when it's baked, it's, there's nothing else you can do. <laughs> Well, and I, I think we tend to think sometimes that, that that problem of writer's block or of getting started is is strictly a creative problem, but I think that that problem exists at every level of life because mm -hmm. my husband is a tech guy, but he always said that he found that it really helped the other people that he worked with if when he would go into a meeting, even if he wasn't running the meeting, if he had at least some idea in mind of what were the things that were gonna be talked about at the meeting and if he wrote a little outline for himself. Because nine times out of 10, he'd get into a meeting and even the leader of the meeting had not come up with an outline or anything. They didn't have a plan. They didn't mm -hmm. have a matrix to fit things into. So he could bring out his outline and say, well, how about this? And then they would have a place to start because mm -hmm. you need a place to start, right? Everything needs a foundation. Yeah. That is such a fundamental truth about the way the world exists. And um, I find this with art a lot, that when I first started painting, I, I didn't see myself as a creative person. So I just thought, well, I'll take a photograph and then I'll, I'll draw it out on this piece of paper and then I'll paint in the spaces with paint, right? And, uh, mm -hmm. and that's what I did it was very unsatisfying and the results were very unsatisfying. <laughs> but at least I had a starting point. I had a photograph. I'm going to work from this. Now, 
But when I got to the place where I wanted to do something more creative and just experiment, then you're looking at this blank canvas. There's nothing there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and uh, I eventually found that for me, the only process that works is to just make a big mess, as big a mess as I can make, so that there's something there. Mm -hmm. And then I can start, as you said, carving away the stuff that doesn't belong or adding a few more things or, you know, you have something to work with. And I think a book is like that, right? You just have to spit out a bunch of stuff, then you can peel away. Yeah. But you, but you have to get it out there first. Mm -hmm. And I, I looked up, I looked up some of your art and I have to say that is, it is both modern and classical and I love it. <laughs> wow. It, classical. I would have never <laughs> yeah, yeah, because because you you really you really make you make real things. Modern stuff doesn't do a lot of real things. They they you know they get all fantastical and weird shapes and all this stuff. And I, I I looked at I looked at your work and I saw your when you were painting people and you actually had faces and and even that you never let that get in the way of it actually looking like it flowed beautifully and it, it was it was modern and completely unpretentious and that was a breath of fresh air looking at your work it was oh, it's well, fantastic thank work thank you i should get you to write my marketing material <laughs> <laughs> well the the thing the reason it turns out that way i think is that i don't start out with a figure in mind mm. i make this chaos I make this mess and then I look at it for a while and I see the figure in there and then I draw that figure out. So I'm not very good at, if somebody said, oh, can you do a portrait of me? Probably not. It's not going to look like you, mm -hmm. but I can, you know, I can try to get something of your essence when I create this mess and then I start trying to find the, so it, when I first started listening to Jordan Peterson and he's talking about order and chaos, mm. totally made sense to me because my art was all about looking into the chaos and trying to find where the order was. And so this whole idea of journeying into the chaos and finding the treasures there and bringing them back. Yeah, mm. I got that completely because that's how I always work. So. Yeah. So when you're writing, um, is that how you work? You, you just, um, you get yourself a kind of a rough draft that has a lot of unnecessary no, material in it and then you uh, carve away or I, what I do is I, it, it's, there's two kinds of writers. Um, there's, uh, planners and pantsers. You write by the seat of your pants. Um, I'm a pantser. So what I what I do is I I I I know scenes that I want and it's the in-between stuff that I have no idea what I'm doing. But if I if I know if I know what the scene is, I can write that scene and then everything above and below it, if I can figure out what the scene is before it and the scene is after it, I can figure out what what to write between it. And that is what the majority of the of the meat of my book has come out is the in-between and I never knew this stuff was there. So it sounds like almost like a screenwriter, the way a screenwriter would approach. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have a mental storyboard. Like I can't, I can't draw that well. And so like, I don't, I wouldn't be doing stick figures or stuff like that, but I've got like movie scenes. So mm -hmm. those, the same, because I love movies and I, you know, I can pretty much quote The Princess Bride. <laughs> and so the, every time I come up with an idea, I'm like, okay, what does that scene look like? Who's over there? What is the framing? And I can, I could probably translate my book directly to a movie because that's the way that I wrote it. Mm-hmm. Did you ever happen to see the video that I did with Sherry about Princess Bride? I probably did, but it's been a while. I'll I'll link I'll link to it in the notes. Okay. Um, 
because we had a lot of fun talking about that. It's a fantastic movie. I, I, I'd almost say it's perfect. <laughs> well, I mean, that would be a fun one to see Matt do a, do a uh, review of, wouldn't it? Matt, Matt who? Oh, isn't that where I ran into you was on the comments to Paul's, um, oh, maybe not. Okay, so Paul Vanderclay oh, did a conversation with Matt. The Matt, Logos guy. Logos made flesh. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, I'd love to see him analyze that. Yeah. That'd yeah, that'd be amazing. Cuz I that, wish he I wish he did videos more often. <laughs> well, it it sounds as though he puts an awful lot of time and thought and energy into each one so I can understand why, especially yeah. if he has a day job. <laughs> yeah, that explains it. <laughs> Do you have a day job? I don't. Unfortunately. I, I tried to get one and um, I I missed, let's just say I missed an opportunity and then this, you know, happened and nobody's hiring right now and so just kind of floating. So in case anybody's watching and they have a job for you, what, what do you do? Um, the only experience that I have on paper is uh, groundskeeping. Um, although I did do an odd job with janitorial, but neither of those are particular particular passionate things. Like I, those are just I did them because I could turn my brain off, mm -hmm. and I just did the work. Um, but right right now, I'm actually trying to do a bit of a gaming channel thing, and it's. It's not doing well on YouTube, but it's strangely doing a lot. It's it's doing okay on Minds. It got 300 something views on it. But I don't know where, if that's going to go anywhere. Minds? Huh? What is Minds? Minds.com. It's, it's an alternative to YouTube. They basically smashed all of the good parts of all the other social media into one thing. Um, and, so, and they have their own they have their own cryptocurrency and, and everything. It's it's entirely built to be uh, supportive to the people that post there. So M I N E S. No, Minds. Minds. Oh, Minds. Oh, okay. Yes. M I N D S. Yes. Okay. It sounds quite a bit like the channel that um, Dave Rubin is putting together called Locals.com. That's that's more of that's more of uh, I don't know if I would call that more like meetup.com. That's directly to content creators to each other and to their fans. And it, it it's like you almost you 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 have to already have an audience for that to really be beneficial. I think. I got I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Yeah. Because I I got on there and I looked into signing up, but in order to sign up, you have to put down an amount of money that you want to get for each view. And yeah. I don't, I don't want to get money for views. I would like to be on another platform so I would get more views, but I don't want to get money for them and you can't sign up for it unless you do that. Yeah. So on a lot of these, um, do you have to sign up for money? For, for money? On uh, com, yeah. No, I, uh, you, you can you can set up you can set up an account for the cryptocurrency, but that's not required. Oh. Um, they'll they'll usually just keep it in your own little wallet that's on the page, um, and they give you a single token, which is like a thousand views, and you can boost a post or something like that. And it's like like Facebook post uh, view posting, uh, boosting. Yeah. Okay. Maybe the, I'll try. The guy that runs that uh, is a friend of uh, that the the news YouTuber uh, Tim Pool. Oh yeah, I know. So, I mean, so I know they love Tim Pool. They work together, uh, and he Tim Tim makes sure that 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 guy keeps his his head on straight as and when it comes to you know free speech and stuff like that, and so mm -hmm. it's a pretty okay place, and okay. and. Apparently, I'm not being suppressed there because I get views. I get views almost immediately. Uh -huh. 
but it's, you know, I, I still have those subscribers. <laughs> it's new. Well, so you, um, you contacted me because you said you wanted to talk about um, time. Yes. And this idea of circles and lines and. Um, yeah. Um, the guy that you spoke to recently um, on, um, on chaos. Michael. Michael, yeah, uh, he brought up he he brought up the difference between circular and linear time, and uh, that caught my interest because I had been talking to uh, another guy that Vanderclay had spoken to, Voth, um, and he and I had had a couple of conversations, and we even have non-recorded conversations that we just go back and forth uh, on each other's books. So. Um, on the video, uh, KG Guy and Voth get together to talk about Voth's book and concepts of time. Um, at 56, 56, uh, he and I get into this conversation of the two the two ideas of time that we had we had brought up in a completely separate talk. Mm -hmm. And it starts out with his. I wanted him to go first because I wanted more time to think. Um, and he has a concept called the cones of possibilities. I think I, I coined that phrase. Like I, I just, I just named that for him, but he might call it something different, but the, so the cones of possi possibilities, uh, you think of, you think of a, a, a human being and you've got all their history behind them and it's a cone le le uh, leading into their back. And there's another cone that's broadcasting out in front of them. And you have a straight line, sorry, you got a straight line going uh, from the center of the cone. And here's the good things that you're doing. And you keep doing good and your line will keep going up towards the top of the cone. And, but you know, you, you mess up something, it's going to start going down and it, if if you if you the the more you're on a certain part of the cone the narrower the the narrower the other side of the cone gets and your possibilities getting get narrower but the the cone stays the same and so the the more and more you get towards the outside of the cone uh the least the less likely that thing is uh, but, uh, but the more that, the more that would have to be done, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm butchering this, the more that would have to be done to get to that unlikely event. So, um, he, he was describing a concept called Panda Hitler, uh, which doesn't make any sense because it's an idea of, of, um, It, evolution says that oh, all this random chance picks out the lucky stuff, stuff and it's like, yeah, but chance, chance can't pick. And evolution, eventually just things get lucky in evolution. A, a big bear that just eats bamboo, there's no benefit to that. It doesn't make any sense. And there's also no benefit to Hitler. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. These are not positives in, in, in the growth of evolution. If, if you put those two things on the graph of an evolutionist, they would say those are outliers. Like, yeah, but they happen. You, you, you have a shotgun pattern of, a, of uh, dots on a graph, and then you try to draw a line through that graph, and it's like, that line isn't real. That line is not what actually happens in the world. And so that, that's where he gets into the cones of like, here's what happened. Here's what's more likely to happen. And- um, so, so let me just, let me just, so the, the cone is broader behind me mm -hmm. and narrower in front of me? No, the, the cone, 
the cone is the same is the same breadth, but your actions can warp the cone. You can you can't change the cone behind you. That's past. That's the past. That's your history. That's that's what's that's what's leading into you. But it's the the one in front of you can change depending on your actions. And if so you're if like you're the cone is coming into me, but then from from here out, it's going like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's so it's a cone of possibility going this way. Yeah, you've got you've got it. You've got a cone coming in and a cone coming out. It's like a it's a and why why it's the concept of time. It's like a it's it's like an hourglass sideways. Well, it's a it's also a chiasm. It's um, we had long con two conversations on this idea of chiasm on my channel where it talks about um, where I talk about. The idea of, well, it's, it's suffering basically mm. because suffering comes in from out here and then you kind of have to go through this narrow place to mm. get out to the other side. Yeah. And that's, that's what suffering does in a life is it narrows your life. It narrows your horizon completely. Mm -hmm. but then when you come out the other side of it, your horizon is widened again. So, you well, know. In writing, it's called a chiasm. We're in a chiasm, and apparently this was something that the ancients used to use all the time as a literary device. Hmm. And you'll see this quite often in the Bible, where there'll be a verse of the Bible, and then a, a corresponding verse that says the same thing, maybe 30 verses later. And then yeah. they'll, and you call that A prime, and then down here is, is uh, B prime, and then or is it old, a prime in Old Testament. It, it's you'll find it in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, mm. and then there'll be another verse within that, and then another verse, and another. And when you, the center verse is the one where the focus is supposed to be, but mm. the verses lead into that center verse and then lead out from that center verse, and you'll see the parallels as they come in like this. Yeah. Because because Hebrew Hebrew doesn't Hebrew poetry doesn't rhyme words it rhymes ideas right and and it'll use repetition mm. yeah they'll 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 always give a pro and a con and a and and they'll they'll re, they'll repeat them uh, they'll repeat them from different people it, and and they've got like the call and response. Of like, and then he said this, and then they said that, and then, and it would, uh, it it would play out in a dialogue. It's that's what uh, what was the the Song of Solomon is a dialogue. It's a really weird dialogue because there's like a group with them. It's like what's going on here? <laughs> well, for example, with the chiasm, you'll see it at a at a lifelong level with the life of Joseph. Hmm. Yeah because Joseph's life gets narrower, narrower, narrower until he is thrown in the cistern and then he ends up in jail in Egypt. And then after he comes out of jail, his life gets wider and wider and wider. So it's like his, his influence is narrowed until it's almost nothing and then his influence is expanded. Wow, and you I hadn't see seen it, that. You see it through the lens of his suffering. Mm. Well, how do you spell that? Chiasm? Yeah. C-H-I-A-S-M. I don't know if you'll ever see anybody say anything about Joseph's life and chiasm, but the reason I thought about it is that I was thinking about chiasms last year and I ran into an old teaching that I had done on the life of Joseph about 20 years ago. Hmm. And I was reading through it and I thought, oh, this is a chiastic structure, and I didn't even realize it at the time. When you mm. when you sit down and study his whole life and you look at it, oh yeah, there it is. And, and in the same way, the, the life of Christ is a chiastic structure. And the cross is the moment when all of his influence is narrowed down to nothing, and he becomes as nothing. And then from there, going out into the rest of world history, his influence expands 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 right and yeah until eternity mm -hmm. but but he also has all of eternity behind him leading yeah. to the cross 
Yeah, it's 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 a, that's exactly the same that's exactly the same structure. Um, there's a there's a a picture called a gyre of uh, it looks like these wave lines, mm -hmm. but they but they 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 go up and then they go down and then they're waving and then they're intersecting together and it it's a it's a visual representation of of the of these cones of influence all happening over and over and over again and they're all intersecting because they're all related <clears throat> but that what where that led to was um i was talking to him about the concept i came up with which which was the the straight spring um i don't know if this has ever been talked about before if it if it has I hope somebody can link it to me because I'd like to read more on somebody smarter than me coming up with something like this because uh, I cannot be the first person to think of this. Um, so in Western time, uh, it's, you know, like A to B. Whereas in Eastern time, things are cyclical um, or at least seen as cyclical. But you know, even in even in the Bible, uh, things are things are seen in these really strange patterns, and it's just like, yeah, but the Bible, the Bible is a straight line narrative. So why are these patterns going on through it? Mm -hmm. um, and I I I'd, I'd been trying to find my old Kindle, I wanted to read more books and I also wanted to dig into my past, uh, my, my church history. And I came across the book, um, Recapturing the Wesleyan Vision. And I was like, okay, I, I keep hearing about the Wesleys. I keep hearing, oh yeah, we're Wesley. I'm like, I don't know what that means. I don't know what the, what the history of all this stuff is. So I started reading on him and John Wesley is fascinating. He was described as an evangelical Catholic in open dialogue with uh, Eastern Orthodox. It's just like, what? <laughs> That's, that sounds like... Uh, that, well, that he sounds like... sounded a little Pentecostal, really, when he talks about his spirit being strangely warmed and... and uh, yeah, very... and we're, we're Pentecostal. So we, we kind of, we draw from that, that line. And we're, so when we... When I when I was reading all that stuff, I'm I'm getting these really uh, big aha moments and figuring out why Dad says say, says things in certain ways. It's like, oh, okay. Uh, but uh, Wesley has this proclivity to to treat things with a with a both and. And uh, so I started to I started to apply that to things and like okay, both and so how can one how can two completely different things be be conjoined in a way that actually makes sense? And so I applied it to the straight and cyclical time, and I didn't even realize. Um, the straight line narrative and and patterns that I had just said previously until I had said that. Because <laughs> uh, I was just thinking about this, and you you said you wanted to bring up uh, when when I mentioned this the the idea or the picture of the sun. Uh, yeah, you want me to show that video now? Yeah, yeah, show that. Okay. Um, let's see. Is there sound to it? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, I'll 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 talk over it then. <clears throat> can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Okay. So, and this is exactly what I'm talking about. This is. There's so many layers to this coil. 
It's like you, you, could, you could see this as seconds, minutes, and hours, and days, and years, and, and even eons. The idea of the straight spring is that you, you zoom out on this, it looks like the straight line of how the, how the sun is moving. But if you zoom in, you can see every single coil. Well, so here he gets in and he shows. Oh my gosh, that is, that is amazing. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> and that, yeah. And then you'll see as he gets in closer. So it's almost like watching a live Mandelbrot set or something. Yeah. <laughs> but then the coils start moving around there. Oh, wow. And then, of course, there's another one. It's, it's, a, the second. it's a fractal. <laughs> Nanosecond, yeah. Wow. <laughs> cool. so, so, yeah, and what, the only part of that that it didn't show was if you, take, if you take a spring and you turn it sideways, this is the way that people describe God being able to see uh, time. He sees all time at the same time. Now, the only thing I, ha I have to say right now, I don't know how to get back to where I was. <laughs> <laughs> because now you're still looking at my desktop, right? Yeah. I, I think you just have to turn off screen sharing. Oh, there it is. Okay, I can never find that button. Okay, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> but yeah, it, if if you see if you see the if you see the spring from from the front, it's a circle, and and it and it coils around. But the the patterns is is what. Uh, Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. And when, when the coil comes around, these two points are the closest they've been in, in years or eons or decades, but they've happened again. It's like, it's not the same thing. It can never be the same thing. The same, the, what happened is literally in the past, but we've come back around. As well, you notice that in your life, don't you? I mean, I notice that in my life all the time. And oh, years yeah. ago, I used to describe it in my own head as like being, I'm on the screw. I've come one rotation around the screw, but now that I'm just that much farther up on the screw, I come back at the same place again. The same old sin is haunting me, but I'm at a new spot on the screw. And I've mm. grown a little bit, you know. Okay, I come back around. Oh, I'm back at that same spot. Same thing again, you know. There, there's an old gospel song that this um, this guy from Mexico used to sing when he'd come to our church, and he wrote it. His name was Simon something or other, but the song was, It's Me Again, Lord. Yes. <laughs> you know, I'm back <laughs> again that. with the same old sin. It's me again. But, uh, but God is faithful. <laughs> I've never heard it described as a screw before. Well, that's just the way it worked in my head. Oh, okay. That's the way a screw is, you know. Mm -hmm. Screw is the same diameter all the way up, but you're always moving up, you're moving up, you're moving up, you're moving up, you're moving mm -hmm. up, you know. So for me it worked. Yeah. But, but it also works when you think of the spiral going around the the earth going around the sun and and well, uh, and the and the and I don't know if you've ever seen this one, but there's a there's a video I should have pulled it up. Hmm. A YouTube of a a pendulum if you inscribe the motion of a pendulum on a cylinder mm. on the, yeah on the cylinder it inscribes a wave yeah and yeah it's haunting <laughs> but the wave the wave is a spiral right so we have spiral cyclones we have spiral galaxies there's mm -hmm. spiral colics on the back of our hair. There's there's a, a per the perfect spiral of the of the, the seashell. Uh, what is that called? The nautilus. I think it's the yes, nautilus. chambered nautilus. Yes. Mm -hmm. The golden section. The golden ratio. The golden ratio. Which yeah. shows up in all sorts of places where it shouldn't show up. Mm -hmm. But um, 
so I, I've mentioned this before on my channel, but I have this deep belief that art and reality are deeply intersected because the golden ratio is a huge part of um, what artists have observed over the centuries as are all the other things that make up reality. <clears throat> and, and in art, you, you understand that certain things are essential for a piece of art to work. Mm. And those same essentials are there for the universe. <laughs> At every level, they have to be there. But I think sometimes the scientists kind of miss that a little bit because they, they don't understand. That thing is an essential. You can't bypass that. Mm -hmm. You can't just pretend it's not necessary because it really is. Well, and there's a, in my second, I think it was my second talk, I was, uh, I was talking to uh, Stefan, and and Paul and we were getting into story and I think Stefan had to leave but Paul and I were talking about like well why why is the story of scientists wanting to upload themselves into uh into the cloud and then just have the simulation of eating ice cream all the time why is that a bad story? It's like, there's no, there's no suffering. It's like, there's, it, there's no, there's no cost. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's no payment and payout. There's no, there, you, there's, there's nothing else going on. It doesn't, it doesn't move forward. And so uh, then he started talking, he said, he said, and, and, uh, he said, it's so strange that, you know, that, that you're a Pentecostal and Pentecostals live in this story and you're talking to a Jungian and they just talk about nothing but stories. It was just like, yes, exactly. <laughs> it's like we, we, we project ourselves as if we live in a story and, the, and we take our, you know, the initial cone of possibility that feeds into us is literally the Bible itself. And it's like, this is the story that feeds into us that we have to project forward. And the, uh, the, the ideas that, that, that come out of that, you know, have to, have to connect properly to that past or it's completely, completely disjointed. Like you said uh, earlier on the foundations, it's just like if you, you have no you have no starting point you have no foundation this is like when you when you said um uh do, do you write outlines I, and i said no i didn't realize that i was kind of like half lying there it's like i do write outlines they're up here they're in scenes <laughs> mm -hmm. well so what do you do with jordan peterson's um Jordan Peterson has this concept that every decision that we make is, is momentous, basically. Everything mm. we do has meaning. Yes. And therefore, every decision we make is momentous. And um, yeah, so when I think about that, I think about the, this book called Art and Fear. You might enjoy that book because it's, you don't have to read much of it. You only I have think to read I've read about, it. You only have to read about 40 or 50 pages to get the main drift of what he's saying to artists. And as a writer, you're an artist. Hmm. Um, but one of the things he talks about is that when you start a work, of, of, whether it's a book or a painting or a piece of music, the first stroke that you lay down, before you lay down that stroke, you have infinite possibility in front of you. Mm -hmm. But once you lay down that first stroke, you've now limited the possibilities. Yeah. And with each stroke that you add, you further limit your possibilities. And so our lives begin as infinite possibility 
I mean, the way I see it, mm -hmm. but the choices that we make draw our lives in smaller and smaller and smaller, basically limiting our possibilities. Yeah. So some people choose to your, your cone shrinks. Themselves and become a specialist in some field mm -hmm. so that they only know this one thing, but they know it better than anybody else in the world knows it. And other people choose to limit themselves by knowing just a little bit, but about a lot of things, but they're still limited. So mm -hmm. we are all limited in what we, and over time, our choices and our aging and all those things that happen limit us more and more and more, you know? Yeah. Eventually we're gonna go through the chiasm when we die and come out the other side. I, I'm, I'm so disappointed in our educational system because I feel like you look you look at at the at the great people and they they didn't know everything but they also didn't know only one thing they knew the great things they were all artists and they knew how to play an instrument and they knew how to write and you know they they knew math and they knew science they knew all of it mm -hmm but they knew the they knew the great and beautiful of it. It, it it's almost like the only time the the only time that people truly under uh understood functional uh like the the functional balance of education and art was i'd have to say roughly around the time of mozart they because they all knew they all they all knew the uh, the ins and outs of artistic expression through each medium. Well, yeah, I mean, probably up until you might say up until the eighteen hundreds. In general, there were yeah. op opportunities like that. I mean, certainly mm -hmm. the Renaissance thinkers were off the hook in terms of all those things and um and we've I, gotten I think, really I think to some extent the founding fathers of the of the united states were um polymaths they oh yeah so they they were they understood mathematics and science and they also understood beauty and philosophy and art and history and all of those things i i think we just um i have my own theories about education but i think john dewey kind of screwed everything up when back in the early 1900s late 1800s i can't quite remember when he came around but that was sort of the beginning of this whole postmodern idea that you that everything was relative <clears throat> so what did what was dewey's contribution other than the decimal system <laughs> oh he he's kind of one of the founding fathers of the modern educational system uh -huh. And one of his basic ideas was that every child is a is a blank slate and it just depends on what environment you put them in. If you put them in a good environment, they'll turn out good. And if they're in a bad environment, they'll turn out bad. And so he threw away the whole idea of that, that fundamentally we have a sin nature. Mm -hmm. and, and so he, his idea was, well, let's just all be nicey nice and then everybody will be nicey nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's which is sort of not the way the world works. You know? It's it's so disturbing because if you if you think of if you think of places in the in the um, mid 1900s. So we've got you know authoritarian governments in Germany, in Russia, in Japan, and and you look at the way that their kids are educated and then you come over to the united states we have the same system <laughs> that's that's really disturbing it's like you realize that this is the same indoctrination indoctrination system that all of these authoritarian governments are using well and it's it you see the danger of it because you might think, oh, we can have this indoctrination system. We can indoctrinate everybody with the right ideas. 
Yeah. Then, then governments change, ideas change, and pretty soon you're indoctrinating everybody in really bad ideas. <clears throat> but you've got the system all laid out, so it's very convenient. All you have to do is shift your ideas a little bit and just start pumping it in. Yeah, and what we, what you were saying with the the founding fathers being you know polymaths, that they hated the public education idea. It's like, are you kidding me? That that that's a terrible idea that you know anything could happen with that and well, well that's what happened <laughs> <laughs> yep well is there anything else you wanted to hit on kevin before we wind this up um well i i i i was bringing up the the idea of of being in the story um because it, uh, something you, something you had reminded me um, had brought that. Oh shoot! Well, you were talking so, about the circle and the line. You were talking about the spring, and you said it had something to do with time. Yeah, and and in t in time. Oh, okay. So where where the idea of the circle, the line, time, the cones, where it all comes together, you and and your your chiasm thing, all of it. It's it's so it's so ridiculous. I I, I say ridiculous positively. Um, God can see all all time at the same time. You know, looking down through the front of the spring, that kind of idea. Well, if he turned that sideways and then looked right at the middle and then just did that, just poked it, just a little bit, the ripples <laughs> through that would go forward and backward. Because he can do anything he wants. He can he, he can pick what points he wants to interact in the on the spring, but the point at which, which all this this culminates is literally at the cross. Well, that's all really of interesting it. when you think about the ripples moving backwards and forwards, because because the cross rewrote the meaning of all the past. Mm -hmm. which which you see with the, the two disciples walking from Emmaus and they meet Christ after the resurrection. And he opens the scriptures up to them. And then they understood all these things that they had been reading that they had never understood before. Yeah. And and then it also sets the ripples moving forward. So it rewrites the future. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. I hadn't hadn't looked at it that way. Yeah, it it it, it completely rewrites. And, and you know the the concept of putting yourself in the story uh vander clay brought up this lady that had literally written herself into her series because she had fallen in love with her main character but she didn't do <laughs> she didn't do it in the power fantasy kind of uh weird fan fiction thing where the characters meet and they're automatically in love that kind of stupidity she had she had built it the way you would actually have a real relationship as them meeting them kind of getting along but they ha they have these these strange catches between each other and they they just can't really uh be together and finally they're not together because they you know they have personality differences until the end like the last book and then then finally they're together it's just like this is how a real relationship goes. You meet the person, you don't initially like them that much, and it's like, love at first sight doesn't work that well, but eventually you start to get to know them, and then, then you start noticing their faults, and it's just like, okay, so it goes back and forth, and eventually it just kind of evens out to the degree where you're like, I can spend my life with this person. But That's one of the funny things about series, isn't it? That they always wait if there's a love interest, they never get the two together too soon because the minute you get the two together, the whole series starts to fall apart. 
Lois and Clark fell apart once they got married. Um, what was the name of that that show with Nathan Fillion where he was a a writer who started working with the New York Police Department and it was a love interest. Oh, oh, Castle. Castle. Detective. Castle. The minute that they got married, they had to start writing in all these catastrophes in order to make the story interesting again. <laughs> I, I think that's because people don't know how to re write relationships. People, uh, and I'm not saying this like I know, but the, the people that have been writing stories recently, you, you, you notice the pattern. When somebody has a stable relationship, there has to be something wrong. You know, somebody has to cheat on somebody. Uh, they, you know, the main character has to come from a broken home. You know, somebody or has to be divorced. Or kidnapped or something. Or, or kidnapped, yeah. Something always happens, when it, when it happens to the relationship, there, something, when it comes to the relationship, something always has to happen. And that bugs the heck out of me. It's just like, can't you guys just write an actual relationship like two people that spend time together and like not everything is about you know sex and intrigue it's just like people can get along just here's what you do you write two best friends then you turn one into a girl and then you go to the beginning and mention that they're married suddenly you've got this great story <laughs> Well, I think people think it's going to be boring. They think stability is boring, but that's that's the that's the lie that this, this our society has told us. Yeah, our lie yeah. tells us that stability is boring. It's really rather nice. I'm very much appreciating it during this particular time <laughs> period because, you know, we hear stories about other people who are so upset about having to spend time with their families. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm very much enjoying spending time with my family. I mean, not that I wouldn't also enjoy being able to go out to dinner or you know do something else, but but we're we're doing fine because we have stable relationships. That doesn't mean that it's all roses. You know, wow. we still have disputes and we have arguments and we have our ups and downs. We have our waves. <laughs> Yeah, but it's stable, which is, it's great to have that kind of a foundation, right? Mm -hmm. And, and you, you can, you can see that people know how to write this stuff because buddy cop movies and buddy cop shows have worked. They, they work all the time that you go through the X-Files and that's these two partners and they, that, that storyline just works all the way through. And there's, there's, you know, ons and offs and all this stuff. But you go, you go to the latest stuff, they're still partners, they're still friends. This is like, this can work. There can be a stable relationship. And all you have to do is write that and then at the beginning, go back to the beginning and write that they're married. That's it. <laughs> You know, I wonder if, I wonder if what they're missing, okay, I think there are several things. I think one thing is that, that um, a lot of Hollywood writers have a prejudice against marriage because well, they think it, You right? look at Hollywood marriages. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, I think they just think in general that marriage is a old fashioned, outdated tradition. Mm. So there is that. Yeah. But then I also think that um, that they overlook the ne the necessary link between love and sacrifice because that's what makes the story is the love and the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. It shows up quite well in a lot of Disney movies. It actually shows up quite well in a lot of science fiction movies, but 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 it doesn't seem to show up so much in movies about marriage. Because movies they, about marriage is either this la la, you know, romantic fantasy that never happened to anybody in, since the beginning of time, yeah. or else they're about these completely disastrous 
relationships. Yeah, it, it's it's either it's either a it's either a terrible horror story or a comedy that's basically a just pornographic perversion of a perfect relationship. It's just like no, this these don't exist. <laughs> it's like you yeah. can't you can't get there. People have flaws, but the 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 problem right now is that you you look at you look at old sci-fi, not new sci-fi. New new sci-fi has fallen into the same trap. Old sci-fi and Disney stuff, old Disney stuff was aspirational because it built on stories that actually did this stuff right. You know, the the and and the Grimm's tales are terrifying, <laughs> yeah. but the Disney people came in and said, okay, how do we build this up instead of just turning it into a horror story? And the way that they built them up is that they brought in old powerful archetypes. And it's like, well, the Lion King is Hamlet. <laughs> it's just, it, it is like point for point. Even with the, the the uncle, and the the only thing that they removed from that is they didn't remove the death; they removed the excessive death. So it's like one person still has to die. It's like yeah, that's because that is the the key point in the entire story. This person dies. That's the key. Great. You don't have to kill off. Morgan Stern and whatever his other's name is. That you'd be killing Timon and Pumbaa. <laughs> Rosencrantz. Uh, so and and Pinocchio is a terrifying story of he eventually turns into a into a real boy and then the the locals freak out and hang him. It's just like Oh, okay. Yeah, we don't want our kids watching that. So they turn him into a hero that saves his his uh, father from the belly of the whale, which is an old Greek story of saving people from Hades. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I agree with you about old science fiction um, was way preferable to the modern. So much of the modern science fiction, they're trying to prove something. Mm -hmm. they're, they're trying to make social justice comments. And once you do that, it's the, same, it's the same problem as Christian movies where they try to be, you know, openly Christian. Yeah. It doesn't work at all because you're just telegraphing. We yeah. have something we're trying to jam down your throat. And a lot of modern science fiction is that way. They have a they have a point of view. They're trying to jam it down your throat. You better get it, and well, it makes the whole thing very uninteresting to watch. And and to to see the the modern uh, Star Trek, it's and then just I mean it's only been a few years. You look at Star Trek now, and then you look at old Star Trek, and you realize, wow, old Star Trek was just kind of hippie-ish. This new Star Trek has completely lost the plot. They've, they've, they've gone dark. It's like old Star Trek, you can watch it because it was aspirational. There was, there was positivity to it. It's just like, hey, this is a, this is a sci-fi thing where we've fixed most of our problems. It's just like all, all the, mo or most of the problems are coming from outside. It's like, okay, yeah, that's great. Doesn't make sense, but that's great. But then you go into, you go into Star Wars, Star Wars was built off of the same stories that, that the Disney stuff was built off of. It's all, it's biblical. You can go back and you can find Bible stories in, in Star Wars. Star Wars now is something. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, I don't think you saw the newest Star Trek Picard. I did. I did. I didn't think of that. I, um, it's not nearly as bad as the other series that have been coming out recently. That's what I thought. Yeah. That they, it has some weaknesses, but it was not nearly as bad as the other ones. 
Yeah, yeah. People are bashing it left and right. It's just like, okay. I, I can say the same thing with this with the Star Wars movies. The first one was like, okay, you're you're messing this up a little bit, but it's still forgivable. The second one, everybody clued in. Okay, this is bad. The third one was, okay, we'll try to fix all of this stuff, and that didn't really work. With Picard, it's it's like they they heard the criticisms of the series that they had been doing. They're like, okay. We see we see the problems here, but we still have to feed into all of this nostalgia, which kind of worked and kind of didn't. So that was kind of okay. And then we've got to, uh, but we still have to shoehorn our agenda in in on it. And that was a little. It was it was heavy handed in certain episodes and light handed in other ones. So it. Again, that got out to the that this is okay thing, and then there was there was little points at which things were shoehorned in the background, and that's at the point where people who were just kind of okay with it just went, "Sorry, no, <laughs> you've you've lost us with this one little plot point. We're gone." And, and they're small. The thing I found really kind of funny was that I wasn't planning on watching it, but then we got offered a free month on CBS All Access or something. And I typically don't watch TV. I just watch YouTube videos of yeah. stuff like this. But I just wanted something mindless. And so I thought, okay, we'll do the free CBS All Access and we'll watch Picard. And I was kind of captivated by the first couple of episodes because it took place in this beautiful vineyard in Italy. You know? Yeah, France, southern France. Or in France, okay. Yeah. So I mean, how can that be bad? And uh, and some of the music they were using and some of the special effects, it was, it was you know, it was kind of captivating. Yeah. But ordinarily I wouldn't have watched it because um, Patrick Stewart had kind of telegraphed his intentions when he gave some interviews a few months ago that the reason he was doing this series was he said, we are out to get Trump. <laughs> I thought, that's so silly. Why would you do a whole TV series just to make a political statement, regardless of who you like or don't like? Well, why would you do that? And, 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 and statements like that, I feel like people are just saying them to get political points because I watched it and I went, which, where does this get yeah. anyone? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that, that was exactly my thought. It's like, I think what he's trying to say is something about illegal aliens and synthetics, maybe. It's like, I, I think that that would be more insulting. It's like, you're calling them autonomous workers? <laughs> <laughs> like, that, that don't have their own free will or that were manufactured? Like, what's... The, your analogy is more insulting than the, than yeah. the gotcha. Yeah, I, I thought that there was, if they were trying to make a political statement, there were some weaknesses there. Yeah, it, but, you know, it, and that's, that's what happens when politics gets into art. You, you, try to, you try to do, you try to shoehorn your agenda into something, and it suddenly, it, you, you can see the holes. People can see the holes, and they're like, oh, okay, so... So this is what you're trying to do there. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm running into that situation in my own book because I'm, you know, I'm a Christian and there's certain things that I don't want to say. And so there, and there's certain things that I don't want to portray. And so when it comes to, you know, people, you know, being flirty and, and kind of pseudo sexual situations, I'm, I'm, not, I'm very uncomfortable with that. Because that's how I grew up. It's just like, I, I don't know how to write this without feeling uncomfortable about it. And then, then when it comes to the politics, like I keep seeing my, my, my political persuasions feeding into the book and I'm just like, okay, I need to write that, not out. I need to, I need to, I need to write that uh, believably because I feel like I just slammed this in front of somebody's face. It's just like, if somebody actually believed this and just believed it, they wouldn't have to say it. They would just do things. 
you know, it, it has to come out more in that the actions of the people, right? I mean, it's kind yeah. of like when Jordan Peterson talks all the time about how your values are obvious from the way you behave, mm -hmm. not from what you say or even what you think you believe. You might think you believe something, but if your actions are not according with that, then you're 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 delusional. You're in denial well, about what you think you believe. And action doesn't save you from being propaganda propagandistic either because when he was asked about frozen he said that's propaganda and it's like what it's like the the it, it wasn't even what was said so much as as what was done is they had turned the person that was supposed to be the hero who was hans they turned the here the the one of the heroes who is the prince, Disney movies, the prince is always the hero. That's it, period. That makes sense. This is the one Disney movie where suddenly the prince is the villain out of nowhere, right at the end of the movie. It's just like, why? <laughs> why? It's like, you're, you're Disney. You're not supposed to do this, or at least do it better. Like, out of nowhere. It's like, make some intrigue near the beginning. It's like, they, they made the... Wesselton was supposed to be the bad guy, and he's just some weirdo off to the side. Just like, with well, they had to do that. every opportunity to make the feminist message, they had to do that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, and and it you can't you can you can try to hide propaganda through actions but it still can be propagandistic. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to put myself in this book, um, you know, without betraying myself, without being propagandistic. And that's a tightrope. <laughs> so one of the people that I, that I sometimes uh, listen to, not so much because he's, he's pretty overtly political these days, but but I understand that his books are really good. I've not read them, but I understand that his books are really good. He's a really good writer. And Clavin? That, yes, Andrew Clavin. Yeah. So how did you know that's what I was going to say? <laughs> <laughs> like political Perfectly writer political. Clavin. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, because he's, he, he's a great writer and he's mostly political right now. And he's, it's funny though, because he's kind of using he's using his platform on the daily wire to put out his new book it's just like really <laughs> okay because <laughs> that was uh what is it the uh the other world or so something like that um another kingdom another kingdom that one yeah yeah and he in he had his he had one of his friends read it through on 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 the channel it's just like all right, I, I guess. I mean, if it gets you ad revenue, <laughs> but the and I, he was one of the first um, audiobooks that I had listened to when I was on my Peterson kick, um, because Peterson said, "Well, you know, read 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 great works and and go through all this stuff." And I read his list, and I went. This stuff's a little too great for me. Like this is, this is, he's got a lot of hard stuff on there. It's like, okay, well, maybe I can start simple. And so I, I looked around, and I was trying to find Christian stuff. And so I was going through, um, I was going through C.S. Lewis's stuff, and this was recommended aside from C.S. Lewis, uh, the the great good thing. I think that's. Clavin's autobiography mm -hmm. and uh he grew up he grew up uh in this kind of weirdly strict but also liberal Jewish household which didn't make any sense and like he his dad caught him reading the bible <laughs> <It's> like, <what? laughs> but it, it it's a, it's such a strange story because I it, it's it's a it's a worst case scenario. It's a best and worst case scenario for a writer. If you if you read that book, this is this is the potential for 
this is the potential for horror for a writer because he literally lost his mind reading his or writing his book. He wrote this book. He spent years on this book and he tried to publish it and it didn't do well and everything went wrong and he lost it. Like he, he had a mental breakdown because this was everything to him. And it's like, oh, that's really bad. I'm working on one big book and it's been years. <laughs> and it's just like, eh, might be overinvested. I might need to write something else as well. But, um, and, but a along with that came, came with this growth of, of, okay, when you crash, where do you go? And he ended up reading the Bible a lot. And I think, uh, I think, I think he said he was, he was typing something and he heard something on the radio. Uh, I think I've heard that story. Yeah, he was, was he heard a synchronicity something. synchronicity that just, you, you just could never believe that it could possibly happen. He was watching a baseball game or something, right? Yeah, he was listening to, yeah, and the guy, the guy said, he was thinking about ending his life, and, and he was listening to the radio, and he heard the guy interview one of the baseball players, and those, that baseball player had a chronic pain, and, okay. And the and the announcer brought it up, and he's like, "How do you how do you do that? Or, or how how are you doing? You know, with that pain?" He's like, "You just play through it, man. You just play through it." And he was, huh? It's like he was, he he was like that close, and he hears that. <laughs> play play through it. Really? You just want me to play through this? Okay. All right. <laughs> Let's see where this goes. He's now a fantastic, you know, successful writer and- Well, have you ever read any of his fiction? I haven't, because I haven't. I, well, so I was gonna say, you might look at how he deals with some of the issues that you're struggling with, because I've heard him talk about that before, mm -hmm. about how to deal with difficult issues when you're a Christian and you're writing stuff that isn't overtly Christian, what do you do with those uncomfortable things, uncomfortable ideas, yeah. concepts, actions, so forth? And so I thought you might just read one of his books and see what he does with it. Well, I listened to his, I, I listened to one of his talks or not talks. He, he, it was like at the end of one of his videos, and it was like his mailbag or something, and somebody had brought something like that up, and he said, I hate Christian stories, because they're, they're <laughs> like, when people write Christian stories, it's just, it's just the Bible all over again, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not well, a story. It's not even the Bible all over again, because the Bible is not really very Christian. I mean, if you're looking at it that way, well, yeah, yeah it's full of, the Bible is full of all kinds of things that that it's 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 church Christian propaganda Christian. instead of the bible yeah 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 if it was the bible it probably would have been great but <laughs> the yeah. the it, it's it just becomes it just becomes propaganda every single time like touched by an angel just becomes creepy and weird and the and the i i can't that's the, my number one issue there is I can't remember what his advice was for that because I, I've seen, I've seen some of, I've seen some of his work cause like they made it into, into movies. Um, and watching those movies, I'm just like, this is like, uh, rated R, uh, eighties action, uh, thriller stuff where you know people are you know ladies are topless and stuff and people are saying all this foul mouth stuff i'm just like he wrote this <laughs> i was just like wow okay well like, I, you never know what you never know what they're going to make of it when they make it into a movie yeah and yeah. and so that that's that's the that's the thing is 
when it comes to that stuff, you can, you can also get away with a lot more when it comes to writing, is you can write those scenes because you're not physically seeing it and things are not as bombastic. It's just like if they tried to make a book of um, Brave New World, they couldn't do it. They could not make a book of the Brave, or, or a movie, a movie of the Brave New World. They could not do it because it shows things that you cannot show at all, like with children and like, it's, it's terrifying and disturbing and gross. And it's just like, you can't show this. You can't make a movie like that. And so you can get away with a book being risque, but the, but when it came, when it comes to that, like, I, I don't know how far I can, I can push myself, like, I can go with, with blood and action and, and gore, because, like, I understand that, I, I understand that, I've grown up with video games, I understand the, the levels of severity, like, I can describe that without being gross, but the, when it, when it comes to, uh, flavoring things in a flirtatious fashion it's just like i don't know how far i can go because i know where my comfort level is and i don't know if that's good artistically <laughs> yeah well i think that's where prayer comes in right yeah. yeah because um god will guide your words and your your thoughts and because who knows what story he wants you to tell you know mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah He's gifted you with the ability to write for some reason, so. I hope so. Maybe we'll talk again sometime and you can tell me a little bit about your book, but I think maybe oh, yeah. we should wrap it up for today. And, oh uh, yeah, I don't, how long, oh, are we at an hour? We're at hour 20. We're at an hour 15 right now, so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this has really been good, Kevin. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, if there's anything you want me to add to the information section under the video, just send me an email. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Good to meet you. Bye. Me too, too. Bye.